It's time to get right with God because Jesus is coming very soon. He's at the door. Folks, I'm tired of hearing about revival. I'm tired of hearing about awakenings. And the last day outpourings of the Holy Spirit. I've heard that rhetoric for 50 years. Just rhetoric. No meaning whatsoever. I'm tired of hearing about people in the church who say they want their unsaved loved ones saved. I'm tired of hearing people say I'm concerned about my troubled marriage when it's just talk, rhetoric. I don't want to hear any more talk about how immoral America has become, how godless our society, how corrupt our business. I'm tired of hearing about Islam taking control and Christians losing power, and how dead the church has become because that too is rhetoric, meaningless. Away with all of our how-to conferences because they accomplish nothing. It's how to cope, how to build a bigger church, how to reach the lost, how to improve your people's skills, and how to impact the world in this computer time. And I look at the whole religious scene today, and all I see are the inventions and ministries of man and flesh. It's mostly powerless. It has no impact on the world. And I see more of the world coming into the church and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world. I see the music taking over the house of God. I see entertainment taking over the house of God. An obsession with entertainment in God's house, a hatred of correction and a hatred of reproof. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. Tell me now, how many churches have you visited recently? How, how many churches do you know well, when you walk in, the Holy Ghost is so strong that every one of your sins are brought up before your face. The loving grace of God. When is the last time you've been to church where you've seen young people under such conviction because the people of God have been on their face? And there's such a concern and there's such an agony that young people are falling on their faces and calling on God because a spirit of conviction is called down from heaven upon them. How many churches have you been Lately, where you hear a word comes forth that so burns in your soul, you know it comes from heaven, you know it comes from the heart of God. I hope you hear it here. Whatever happened to anguish in the house of God? Whatever happened to anguish in the ministry? It's a word you don't hear in this pampered age. You don't hear it. Anguish means extreme pain and distress. The emotion so stirred that it becomes painful, acute, deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you, in you or around you. Anguish, deep pain, deep sorrow, agony of God's heart. We've held on to our religious rhetoric and our revival talk, but we've become so passive, our so-called awakenings, our stirrings, last but a short time and when the last when the re short-lived revivings and awakenings come from the hand of God they are so short-lived and in those times we promise God we'll never return to our passivity but it's not long it's just weeks or months and we're back and this time we slip further back into passivity than when we started I speak from experience and we say this time oh God you've touched me for life I'll never be the same. And it's like fireworks. A loud bang, a lot of noise, and then it dies. All true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. You search the scripture and you'll find that when God determined to recover a ruined situation, he would seek out a praying man and he'd take him down into the waters of anguish. He would share his own anguish for what God saw happening to his church and to his people. And he would find a praying man and he would take that man and literally baptize him in anguish. You find it in the book of Nehemiah. Jerusalem is in ruins. This is the center of God's interest on earth at the time. This holy city 
and it's wasted and it's full of iniquity. Mixed marriages with the heathen. They were enslaving their own people, making slaves out of the poor. The house of God was polluted with filth. The high priest was in league with Tobiah, a heathen reprobate. And how is God going to deal with this? How is God going to restore the ruin? How does he do it? What does he do? You see, we face a similar situation, except ours is many times worse. The time when men, according to the prophecy of Jesus, wax worse and worse, and that is happening. A church that's defiled with pedophilia, child molestation, adultery, a nation in a moral landslide that's inundated with pornographic filth that the whole world blushes at. Now, I believe in the love of God. I've preached mercy grace and love covenant of love and I believe in preaching the goodness and long suffering of Christ but multitudes today are being saturated with your okay messages we've got people now that are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness we become like the children of Israel who said the right words but here's what God said. I've heard the words of this people. They have well said all that they've spoken. All that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. He said, oh, you have the right words. You sing the right songs, but your heart is not right. Does it matter to you today that there's such a coldness sweeping the land? So many people I know that were my friends and I see them go one by one, husbands and wives into such passivity, going to churches where they can find smooth messages, no longer wanting to hear anything of wrath or of correction. You see, when spiritual blindness comes, very few recognize it. It's the last recognized thing that happens to a child of God. If I, as a pastor, knew you personally, and I was watching your life. And as one of the pastors of this church, I come to you and say, I, I, I love you, but I have to tell you the truth. You're changing. You know what you were. Something of the world has got in your heart. I don't know if it's television. I don't know what it is that has your heart, but I see changes in you. I, I don't see the brokenness. I don't see the compassion you had once for your family. I don't see concern for your unsaved loved ones. You're changing. Little by little, something's happening to you. Would it bring you to your knees when the ruin that you are not even aware of is suddenly brought before your eyes? You've lost your fight. You see, when you, when you read the book of Joshua, it's almost a book of failure because they lost their heart. They lost the fight. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. Concern is something that you, that begins to interest you. You take an interest in a project or a cause or a concern or a need something that gets a hold of your attention and usually it comes through some emotional stimulus you know you you can hear uh like like we heard last sunday from south africa and all of the hundreds of thousands dying with aids and the children and you can hear what we heard from sister hulda Bontain this afternoon of of the thousands upon thousands of children dying in Calcutta and in India you can get all stirred up about it and you can get emotional and, and you get very concerned but folks there's a difference between concern and anguish because you see you can tie yourself to a cause you can get excited about it or some project you can talk it up you go public with it you can advertise it you can support it organize it put a lot of effort into it 
I'm going to tell you something I've learned over all my years, 50 years of preaching. If it is not born in anguish, if it has not been born by the Holy Spirit, where what you saw and heard of the ruin, if it drove you to your knees, took you down into a baptism of anguish where you began to pray and seek God. Folks, this church was born in anguish. Six months of anguish, tears. And I've never had anything that's been any worth to God in my 50 years that wasn't born in agony. Never. Never. It's all been flesh otherwise. <laughs> oh, everywhere I go, somebody's got a project. Somebody's got a plan or a dream. That's all it is. It's an idea. They didn't come to me from a broken heart. They didn't come to me after hours of fasting and praying and mourning. Not a broken heart. It's an idea. I'm sick of it. You see, a true prayer life begins at the place of anguish, a place where lifetime decisions are made. You see, if you, you set your heart to pray, God's going to come and start sharing your heart, His heart with you. He's going to open up His heart, and I'll tell you, there's pain in His heart. But He sees, and so few to hear, He's going to show you the condition of his church. He's going to show you the condition of your own heart. And he's going to ask you a question. What is it to you? What is it? And that anguished servant has to make a decision. And everyone hearing me now, you're going to have to make this decision. I have to make it. You either get up from your anguished place. You walk out of the baptism waters of anguish you say I can't handle this I can barely make it as it is I don't want it God I have enough I just want to be an ordinary Christian I don't want to carry this kind of a burden I don't want to have to weep over my family anymore Lord, I'm just going to take it by faith see you have to make a decision you're going to come and he says now if you're going to bear my burden, if you're going to be an instrument of restoration, if you are expecting somebody else to be an instrument to win your family or to do this work, you're mistaken. I've burdened your heart, I've given you my heart, and I've opened up my anguish to you, and I'm letting you feel it and share it so that it will bring you to your knees. Because it is there that I'll speak to you the word of direction. And that's what happened to Nehemiah. He came eventually out of the waters of anguish with a clear word that nobody could reject. He brought the city and nation to its knees. You find that in Nehemiah, the 8th chapter. You see, you, you, you either walk away and go back to your passivity you say, I'm just going to be an ordinary Christian, and there's no such thing. Or, your heart begins to cry out, oh God, your name is being blasphemed. The Holy Spirit's being mocked. The enemy is out trying to destroy the testimony of the Lord's faithfulness, and something has to be done. You can't go unchallenged. And anything you try to do, Without this baptism of anguish, it's going to falter and fall. It's not going to work. Prophet Amos cried out to such, Woe to them that are ease in Zion, eating, chanting their music, but they're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. And in the original Hebrew root word, they are not agonizing in prayer over the ruin in, the, in, Jeru, in Joseph or Israel. They're not agonizing. They're not in anguish about the conditions. Comedy, yes. Happy singing, yes. Eating, fellowship, good time, yes. Weeping, anguish, praying, fasting, no, no, no. 
will not have it. Folks, let me tell you something. Out of this baptism of anguish comes a marvelous thing that happens to those willing to submit to it. A marvelous thing. It's the instant, prompt knowing of God's voice. Instant. Now see, if you don't have a history of prayer, if you don't have this willingness to share God's heart, you get it by asking Him for it. He said, I'll, I'll give. I'm more willing to give you are to receive. This is something you ask. Oh, God, I, I, I want to step out now and I want to know your heart. And when you begin to seek his face, you allow him to melt and break you. You come into this communion with the Lord. Out of that experience, you see, God hasn't called us to live in anguish. This is the birth, this is the womb of something God is stirring, God wanting to accomplish and, and bringing out of ruin, restoration in your family, whatever it may be. he bring you down into this baptism. Now, just like the baptism of waters, you come up, you come out. But you'll come out with this instant knowing of God's voice. There are times you're not going to know what to do. You have no time to run to the closet. You have to hear his voice. This is the way, walk in it, instant. That is a glorious result of the baptism of anguish. You see, that's the result of taking on the heart of God. The ultimate joy of seeing God fulfill his word and his covenant promises in your life. There's nothing of the flesh will give you joy. I don't care how much money, I don't care what kind of new house there is. Absolutely nothing physical can give you joy. It's only what is accomplished by the Holy Spirit when you obey Him and take on His heart. He gives you the knowing of His voice. That instant knowledge. God saying, this is the way, walk in it. And then the wonderful joy of seeing God answer your prayer build the walls around your family build the walls around your own heart and make you strong and impregnable against the enemy God that's what we desire